So um, I want to keep picking on this example of water. Water is it's just a fascinating molecule. There are still loads and loads of active current research going on trying to just understand the nature of water from a molecular level and of course how water influences biological systems, environmental systems, engineering systems, and so forth. So water, always an interesting example. Um, so here we can see those normal modes and these energies, like I said, th these would be for isolated gas phase molecules. Okay. So the first thing I want to point out is the vapor. Um, and so we can see here, these are all of the rotational lines. Um, because since it's a, a vapor, a gas, we're, we're going to see that those vibrations will stimulate the excitation of a rotation. Okay. So water as a gas is going to exhibit these nice rotational lines and also it's stretching frequencies. So here we're only seeing the stretching frequencies out at 36 and 37. Okay. The bend, right? We're not even seeing on this scale. Um, but those for water vapor, those will occur at higher energies. So those bonds have to vibrate at a higher frequency and they're generally as a vapor, not really being influenced by anything else. Assuming we're in the ideal gas regime, right? Where other neighboring water molecules aren't influencing each other. Um, so what you're seeing right here is a confluence of J terms, um, you know, J plus minus one. And all we're seeing is from new uh, one to zero. Okay. But because we have two modes here, there's the, um, right, the symmetric and the asymmetric. There are two sets of P, Q, and R branch going on these vapor lines. And so that's why it, it looks chaotic. So doing a P, Q, R branch analysis on this would be quite difficult um, because of how complicated that system is. Okay. So now if we look at liquid water, okay, it looks like we've just got one big continuous peak here, but in fact, there are two underlying peaks. Okay. So, um, I'll point to this liquid and we'll say it's convoluted. So in other words, the symmetric and asymmetric stretch are occurring at very similar energies and they're right on top of each other, right? We can see for an isolated water molecule, those are only about a hundred wave number difference. Um, which will be similar as a liquid. However, they're now shifted to lower energies, and that's because the presence of other neighboring molecules can assist in those vibrations, right? We've got other molecules nearby that can help push and pull those vibrations. So an I FTIR is a fantastic technique for working out intermolecular force details um, just by the simple observation of seeing how these phases shift to smaller energies, right? Remember smaller wave number, smaller energy. So high energy, low wavelength, low energy, high wavelength. Okay. So, but what's really going on with this liquid water, we have to do what's called spectral deconvolution. So we need to separate these two peaks. And the way we do that is by fitting this with a set of Gaussian functions. Um, and this is what you're doing in your spec one assignment. Okay. And so really we recognize that there is, you know, a peak associated with the asymmetric and there's a peak associated with the symmetric. Okay. And both of those are occurring at very similar energies. Both peaks are really broad. And the reason why they're broad is because water is quite chaotic as a liquid, right? The presence of these other neighboring molecules can influence the energies to not necessarily occur 
exactly at a, a quantized frequency every single time, right? If we had single isolated molecules, we would certainly see, right, um, you know, single lines. But therein lies the rub, right? By definition, we can't have a single isolated liquid molecule. Okay. And so now when we look at ice, you can see ice continues to shift to lower energies. It's much more rigid. Okay. So those bonds are a little bit stiffer, um, but also get some assist from neighboring molecules, right? Um, and you also notice that the symmetric and asymmetric stretches are in different proportions, right? So if I were to try to do a deconvolution on this, perhaps I can see that the asymmetric stretch is giving rise to this shoulder. So we give all kinds of creative descriptions to features in spectroscopy. So typically when you see a feature like that, we call that a shoulder because it literally just looks like a shoulder. Um, so perhaps um, the asymmetric stretch looks something like this at lower um, intensity and the symmetric stretch, right, is occurring, you know, way up something like this, okay? And of course, we know that what, what we really observe in spectroscopy, right, is the total. So when both of those get added together, right, we see uh, the constructive interference of both of those peaks. So deconvolution is the process of fitting our spectral data to multiple, um, typically a Gaussian peak, um, but in some techniques, a Lorentzian is acceptable. A, a Lorentzian is best described for the Doppler effect. Um, and all of this is described in your spec one assignment. There's lots of nice background info um, to, to get you going on this, okay? Um, but even if we weren't looking at just simple arrangements of molecules like vapor, liquid, ice, suppose we were looking at really complicated arrangements of molecules, perhaps some intermediate in a chemical reaction or some you know, molecule adsorbed to the surface of something, right? So we can also use this deconvolution process to, to work out those types of details when we have non-trivial arrangements of molecules, okay?